Welcome to panel two. We're going to talk about marijuana legalization uh, in case you didn't know what we were going to talk about. <laughs> um, I want to introduce our panelists, Mick Dumkey. And, whoa, I'm getting feedbacky things happening. Um, Mick has been writing for the reader since 2005. There's a bunch of great articles that you should pick up. If you haven't read them, go read them now. Well, not now, but right after this. Um, the Grass Gap, fabulous, all of his articles. Um, reporting in-depth stories on political issues such as the notorious, and this will be known to Chicago people, notorious parking meter deal, gun control, budgeting tricks, governmental transparency, race and poverty, and drug policies. We're, he's here really for the parking meter deal, though. That's what this is going to be about. Um, he previously did stints as a staffer for the Chicago News Cooperative, the Chicago Reporter, and newspapers in Michigan and Virginia. And his work has also appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune magazines, and other publications you've never heard of. Michael Lee. Michael Lee is in the process of completing his Master's of Science in Public Policy Management from Carnegie Mellon University. He was graduated from UC San Diego where he studied both political science and linguistics. He served as a community development volunteer in various parts of the Dominican Republic for two years and an English teacher in Peru. And most recently as a strategy analyst for the New York City Police Department. Very interesting. His academic research has focused on drug policy with an emphasis on Parking meter deals, no, marijuana laws and markets, and on crime policies. Um, Anna, and I don't know how to say your last name. Kaznick. Anna, Anna Kaznick will earn her Master of Science in Public Policy and Management from Carnegie Mellon University in the fall and holds a degree in Spanish from Georgetown University. She's worked with adult learners teaching English as a second language and basic, adult basic education through Literacy, AmeriCorps, and the Greater Pittsburgh Literacy Council, um, and has volunteered and interned with several nonprofits in the Pittsburgh area. Um, she's currently working with Professor Jonathan Cal Calkins, a respected public policy researcher who has public published extensively, and when I say extensively, extensively, on marijuana decriminalization. In fact, that's why this paper is on legalization, because decriminalization is boring now. Um, Reverend Al Sharp, to people in Chicago, you probably know him and you probably love him. Reverend Sharp has served as the ex Executive Director of Protestants for the Common Good since May of 1996. He graduated from the Woodrow Wilson uh, School, Princeton University, with a Master's of Public Affairs, and he earned his Master's of Divinity degree from the Divinity School of University of Chicago. He is ordained in the Uni United Church of Christ in January of 2007. And um, you know what? Al is well-known, well-renowned, well-loved, and you can read the rest of his bio. I'm not going to keep going because we have to move on to Allie. Allie, how do you say your last name? And I'm terrible, but I don't know. Nagib is the assistant director of the Illinois chapter of the National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws otherwise known as normal, and has held this position since February 2011. In the role of assistant director, he has worked to educate the public, lobby elected officials, and organize efforts in the community to reform cannabis policy in Illinois. He, earned, he holds both a bachelor's degree in economics and an MBA from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And thank you so much to our esteemed panel, and let the hot legalization discussion begin. All right. Well, um, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Kathy for inviting us. And um, thanks to uh, the folks on the panel here, some very sharp people up here um, that I'm sitting with. I'm the reporter of the group, which is why I'm the most underdressed. Um, just get that out of the way first. <laughs> but uh, we're here to talk about marijuana legalization. And uh, this is not just um, an academic uh, discussion at this point in time. There are currently two ballot proposals um, that are uh, going to be considered by voters this fall, one in Colorado, one in Washington, that um, directly will have asked voters to directly weigh in 
on the question of marijuana legalization, but not just uh, for use. And well, a couple of our panelists may get into that in a second. Um, and then there are also a number of other state initiatives that are out there uh, looking at this issue. Bottom line, guys, is that people are talking about this all over the place. And so I think what we wanted to get into here is a little bit of not just the uh, yay or nay, because I don't think there's anybody on this panel. Well, I don't know. I don't know everybody. But I don't think anyone in this panel, um, my, my hunch is, is uh, going to say that it's a straight yay or nay kind of discussion, that there are many complexities to this issue, and that's what we want to get into. So um, I think first, before we start the, the free-for-all, um, maybe just go down the table and have everybody weigh in for uh, you know, a, a short minute or two minutes, whatever you need to say. Say your piece. Why are you here uh, talking about marijuana legalization? Uh, I'm going to defer to Anna to go first. Um, she's actually going to provide a little bit of background information on the issue uh, in general, um, talk about the proposals in play. There are about 17 of them right now, uh, two actually on the ballot. Um, but she'll get more into those details, and then I'm going to come in afterwards to talk a little bit about uh, potential impacts on society if one actually does pass. Yeah, sure. So, oh, and tell me if I make a signal if I'm not loud enough. But I'll just kind of go quickly through. I know that we're short on time. But to first give you some background about where this came from, so this paper is an extension of a class. It was just a, actually not even a full semester, a seven-week class called Policy, Policy Modeling Workshop. And this is the third time that it's been offered. It's uh, taught by Professor Jonathan Hawkins at Carnegie Mellon. And sorry, um, it has a very uh, real-world policy-oriented scope. So the first year was offered, it focused on California Proposition 19. And then last year, it focused on medical marijuana. And this year, as we're discussing, it's about um, legalization of marijuana. So in the culmination of the course, there were presentations in DC for the director of the um, Office of National Drug Control Policy, as well as the director of C Congressional Affairs for the DEA, and um, some members of Congress as well. So, and the, the analysis that we're presenting isn't just uh, Mike and, and my analysis solely. It's really a joint effort from the whole class, so I just want that to be clear too. Um, so yeah, so there are 17 proposals um, that were on the table for 2012. And in terms of um, viability, so there are two that actually have made it on the ballot. So Cal or, I'm sorry, Colorado regulate marijuana like alcohol and Washington um, Initiative 502. And, and the, the different propositions, they do vary in terms of um, how viable they are. So, um, sorry. Sorry, I just want to skip ahead to two certain parts. Um, so I think, I guess to, to start with in, in looking at these 17 proposals, that the most important part is that this isn't decriminalization, this is legalization. So it's legalization of commercial cultivation, processing, distribution, and sale, not just the possession of smaller amounts. And this often isn't reported accurately in the media. So even the New York Times, when they were talking about Colorado regulate marijuana like alcohol, talked about decriminalization, talked about personal possession, and these are uh, the same as they made were true, but only referred to certain parts of the proposition, didn't take into account the whole proposal, which goes much further beyond those steps. So um, if one of the, these proposals passes this year, it would really be an unprecedented step, something that we haven't seen before. Um, and then looking at the two most important ones to be on the watch for, so Colorado and Washington, uh, both of these, in, based on recent pollings, have shown about 50% um, hovering just around 50% in terms of support for the bill. So it is plausible that one of these could pass in 2012 and that we could have state legalization in one of these states. There are also a couple other bills, um, or I'm sorry, a couple other proposals that that could potentially still pass. So um, Oregon, the Cannabis Tax, Tax Act, as well as Initiative 24, still have some time to collect signatures, but and they do have some substantial support, but this at this point, they don't have enough signatures to make to the ballot. They have till July, and based on historical tendencies and, and um, uh, uh, demographies in Oregon, it seems plausible that it, if it were to make it to the ballot in Oregon, that it could pass. 
Um, no, you know that we're not talking about California, even though just two years ago, California's Prop 19 had 46.5% in favor. So two years later, you would think that we might have had a California bill on the ballot, or I'm sorry, I'm saying bill, I really mean proposal, um, on the ballot. But actually, and there were five um, marijuana-related proposals this year in California. And the one that had the most support was California regulate marijuana like wine, but that actually is already dead. So it didn't meet the requirement in terms of signatures. Um, so, so the two to watch out for most are um, Colorado and Washington. And then, sorry, to, to skip ahead then to, in terms of what we'll be looking for in these proposals. So um, as Mick kind of touched upon, it's not really a binary choice legalization versus um, not legalization, there are all these details that really do matter and the type of proposal that to get passed will have different kinds of implications. So uh, in thinking about the proposals, it's useful to think of them in, in three different categories. So there's repeal only and these are ones that are um, the most sparse in their, um, their details, their specificity. So for example, Michigan's was just 88 words long they literally just repeal the prohibition of, mar of marijuana, um, though with the exception for minors and for driving. And then the, the other side are the um, repeal and regulate, which are much more specific, so they have a specific tax structure. Um, they generally all provide, or I'm not saying all, but a lot of them um, allow grow your own, so they really go into specific details and um, both Colorado and Washington, the two bills on the or the two proposals on the ballot this year, fall into that category. And then the third category is uh, kind of repeal and delegate. So it's in between these two. And these proposals basically say that there will be a regulatory structure, and that, but they delegate the details to either an existing state body or a newly formed body. Um, and then just one final point about these proposals is that um, they also vary in terms of kind of their level of professionalism. Um, so you'll have some that there, where there's some ambiguity that doesn't seem totally intentional. Um, and it, it's sometimes hard to discern where they stand on certain um, points. And then um, they also vary in terms of their cognizance of continued federal prohibition of marijuana. So um, some proposals specifically recognize that it will still be um, prohibited under federal law, but then others, like for example, um, Oregon having a state-owned store puts state employees in direct violation of the uh, Controlled Substances Act. So this is something that Michael will talk about a little further. Um, so that has specific uh, implications for the federal response. Oh, did you pass out the handout? I did not. I realized that as I was talking. We actually brought some handouts, and I, I have forgotten multiple times. I, I meant to bring it up right when I came in. So we have we only have 15, so that's not enough. But <laughs> I, can I, I can, we can pass them down the aisles. We can pass them And it My just brother. has some of the maybe, pictures. Maybe the reverend on the panel will uh, help us a little loaves and fishes when we get done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should, have, I should have been uh, clear from the outset. Um, these guys uh, right here uh, to my left are uh, co-authors, co-researchers of this, this uh, very compelling paper that takes a close look at some of these um, uh, proposals that are up, that have been up this year before the, uh, before the electorate. Um, so uh, Anna talked to us a little bit about the, the overview of these things. Uh, Michael, what's, what could happen if one of these things uh, actually passes? Um, well, there are a whole lot of things that could happen and the, the uncertainty of how it will play out cannot be understated. Um, and I'll get into a lot of the details about where that uncertainty comes from. Um, and in the handouts that you see, I'll, I'll refer you to some of the figures that we have in there to, uh, as I make my points. Um, but the first variable that will really have a significant impact on how legalization plays out, no matter what proposal passes in what state or whatever is how the federal government responds to a state legalizing uh, because marijuana will not be legal nationally um, the federal government will continue to prohibit it it'll be it's it's similar to um, alcohol prohibition when back in 
1923, New York State actually repealed the state law that prohibited alcohol, and the federal government continued to enforce federal prohibition. Um, and the state didn't have any more involvement in, in the law enforcement side of prohibition. Um, but when we think about marijuana, the very interesting thing uh, to consider is the number of arrests. And in 2010, there were 800,000 marijuana sales and possession arrests in the United States, uh, only 3% of which were made by federal agencies. Um, so if a state legalizes, that the, the state and local law enforcement personnel in that state would no longer be making arrests, and the number of individuals that the federal government would have to arrest in order to make up for arrests in that state would be incredibly high and difficult for the federal government to achieve. And there is a chart, or actually, yeah, there are two charts in the handouts that we're passing around. One is a bar graph that shows the percent of sales arrests in each state, not percent, the number of sales arrests in each state that state and local agencies make and the number that the DEA makes. And you'll notice that the DEA, the number of arrests that the DEA makes is a tiny sliver compared to the number of arrests that the state and local law enforcement personnel make. So the state legalizes that huge number of arrests for marijuana sales would be gone. And if the DEA or the federal government or whoever at the federal level wants to continue to enforce prohibition um, for whatever objective they have, uh, reduce use, increase price, um, it would be incredibly difficult for them given resource constraints to make all of those arrests. Um, and how difficult, you'll see in another, bar, in another chart that shows uh, the number of law enforcement personnel in the DEA compared to the number of law enforcement personnel in Colorado, Washington, and California. And you'll notice that the DEA employs half as many people for law enforcement as does Colorado uh, nationwide, and about half as many for Washington as well. California dwarfs the number of law enforcement personnel uh, that the DEA employs. And then you compare that to the budgets. Um, the DEA budget per employee is much higher than any state law enforcement agency, um, possibly because federal agents need more training or qualifications or whatever. But if they want to make up for all of the arrests that a state would no longer make in state and local law enforcement, they would have to increase their personnel, which would require an increase in budget that would be unprecedented and for all intents and purposes, um, nearly inconceivable, uh, especially if it's California legalizing. There's just, we can't imagine a, a scenario in which the DEA can actually make up for that many arrests when California makes more sales arrests in only California than the DEA makes in the entire country. Um, so if California ended up legalizing, it would be a nightmare for the DEA uh, if they actually did want to continue to enforce prohibition. Um, if Colorado was the only state to legalize, maybe they could try. If Colorado and Washington or any number of small states end up legalizing, uh, again, it becomes very difficult for the DEA to come in and say, all right, now we're going to make up for all of these arrests that the state isn't making anymore. Um, so why is this important? Uh, well, before I get to that, actually, there are other things that the federal government can do other than arrest people that uh, takes on, that, that that's an act of enforcing prohibition. Uh, one is that it can write letters. Um, this is a practice that it does in uh, enforcing medical marijuana. So uh, think of California or Colorado or any state that has a medical marijuana um, infrastructure, uh, you've got these dispensaries where patients can go and if they are approved by a physician, show their card and obtain marijuana. Uh, the suppliers that cultivate or that sell marijuana from these dispensaries sometimes receive letters, for, or not the suppliers, the people that rent to the suppliers. So if I'm a landlord and I rent to a distributor or a cultivator, um, I could receive a letter from a U.S. attorney that says, you are, uh, your business, your 
property is involved in actions that are illegal at the federal level, stop that or we will take it from you. And that has its desired effect and we would all understand why. Um, so they could do that if a state legalizes. Similarly, if I'm a producer in a legal state and I want to lease a, loca a location to produce and my landlord tells me you need to get out because I'm gonna lose my building if you don't, um, that, that could be a viable strategy. Another strategy that the federal government would have is, uh, it comes from what's called the preemption doctrine. And the preemption doctrine is, uh, it originates from the supremacy clause in the Constitution which says that any law at a subnational level, so if a state creates a law, and that law makes it impossible to comply with both federal law and state law, then the state law is null. Um, and so if we think about marijuana and legalizing it, um, there are different degrees of conflict that a state law can, can have with the Controlled Substances Act. Um, if you just repeal, you're not coming into conflict because um, like New York did with alcohol, when you repeal, all you're, all you're doing is canceling the state law that says, okay, it's illegal here now. Um, doesn't make it, it, that doesn't make it impossible to comply with federal law. Uh, however, a repeal and regulate proposal where you're creating state regulatory structures that, uh, you know, Oregon, for example, they have, they restrict retail sales to state stores. So in effect, state employees would be selling marijuana and that would be something that could possibly be preempted because how do you comply with federal law if you're a state employee who, ha the, the, your job description is to sell marijuana. Um, another bill, or proposal, excuse me, in California, I forgot which one, uh, actually made it a misdemeanor to infringe on someone's right to consume, which means that if you are a DEA agent in California and you make an arrest for an individual who has marijuana, because you know it's your job to enforce federal prohibition, then you would be committing a misdemeanor in California. I, I think they're gonna. You have extra copies to hand out so people uh, can see it. I did it. <laughs> Amazing. Ask and you shall Amazing. receive. Exactly. Let me just because um, we we don't have tons of time. Let me just jump in so we can kind of keep the conversation going. I want to want to come back to the paper, obviously, in a second, okay. and talk about the whole question of price and and uh, supply and demand and that sort of thing that could be impacted by this. But I um, wanted to go to our panelists at the at the end of the table. Um, Al, what, what what why are you here? Why is this why is this an issue for Protestants for the common good and for public policy uh, folks. This is fundamentally a moral issue. And uh, on, the, on the first point about all the people that uh, have uh, been arrested, you have to say, you know, if you've got that many people disobeying the law, maybe it's not such a good law. Uh, and whether you can translate that into a moral concern may take a little work, but I do think it's a, it's a valid point. Uh, and as to what the federal government is going to do under the preemptive clause, uh, one has to look at why they're so staunchly opposed, uh, and I think the reasons are, to, in, in many cases, truly immoral reasons. But let me be positive about the moral concerns here. Uh, that is uh, what I am concerned with as an individual that heads an organization that tries to mobilize people of faith around uh, public issues and bring together uh, the intersection of faith and politics on issues we think are fundamental to the gospel message. Uh, we had a panel, uh, last year, a symposium, if you will, uh, and it was uh, called Drug Policy uh, uh, Reform, a Christian Imperative, question mark. And the tagline for the conference, I think, says volume. Uh, it was, be kind, be wise, be just. Those of you who have read the Old Testament know how evocative that is of Micah 6.8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? Now, how does that translate into drug policy? Let's just take each one very briefly. Rick. Be kind. Treatment as an alternative to incarceration. Doesn't that make sense? If someone's really an addict, you're going to put them in jail? I mean, that's the minimum form of kindness is to give them help if they're ill. Addiction uh, in its very severe forms, uh, maybe milder, is an illness. So don't throw them into prison. Be kind. 
That's the short version of what be kind means here in relation to drug policy. Be wise. We heard in the earlier panel, I think, uh, that uh, uh, of individuals who come out of prison in Illinois for low-level drug offenses, for the most part, we're not talking about violent uh, criminals here. A third are going to be back within three. Uh, Fifty percent are going to be back within three years. That's pretty darn costly. You're recycling people in and out of prison. So what about the be wise part? And I would argue that wisdom is a moral issue uh, as well. Uh, the be just part, I'm very proud of the fact, uh, with the help of uh, Representative Howard, that Protest Protestants for the Common Good, I think, anticipated. I think it's fair to say that uh, we anticipated uh, the argument that's now brought forth with such eloquence by uh, legal scholar and author Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow. Essentially, she's arguing in that book that uh, you can't be racist anymore in this society in an overt way. I mean, people are, but it's not so politically acceptable now. But you can be racist in a colorblind sense. And what we are doing with victims of the, of the war on drugs is uh, a form of racism that's colorblind, but no less racist for being that. Uh, in simple terms, um, we know that drug use is pretty much constant across races, and yet eight times as many African Americans as whites uh, are uh, in jail uh, for um, uh, drug offenses, uh, and that comparison is the inherent injustice that I'm talking about. So on those three fronts, be kind, be wise, be just, uh, I think we're talking about fundamental moral issues. Legalization fits into that. Uh, and I'll make uh, one, just a couple more points, because one thing I'm trying to do, look forward to doing when I have more time to do it, is to try to write a sermon, if you will, to the faith community that takes the public policy, the, the wonkish concerns, and I'm as much a wonk, I think, as you guys are, uh, that takes those concerns and translates them into uh, how people of faith can hear what we're concerned about. And it, there's an example that I was telling Mick about before the panel started. You know, we can talk, for example, about all the money that's wasted on the war on drugs. And we know uh, that the war on drugs is a failure. We know we've spent trillions not just millions or billions, but trillions of dollars to make that failure a reality. Okay, you lecture a congregation, you go into a church and you put that into a sermon and they say, first of all, you're not supposed to be talking about facts and numbers in a sermon, but suppose I did something different. Suppose I used the word stewardship. We have resources that God has given us. It is our calling as people of faith, regardless of the faith, and I think it is true across all faiths that I know and respect, we are to use those resources widely wisely. That's a matter of stewardship. Well, I'll tell you, in the Christian community that I am a part of, people will hear that in a way that they, uh, they might not hear it otherwise. Finally, I would say uh, that there should be an absolute congruence between morality and intelligence. If something is supposedly moral but not intelligent, it's probably not very moral. If it's intelligent in the sense it has all the facts and figures right, but it doesn't speak to our basic moral sense, it's not, uh, it's not truly intelligent. So if you think the war on drugs is a failure, as I do, we've got an obligation to be both moral and intelligent. All right, given all that, Ali, why, as Anna said, are these, um, first of all, there are only two ballot initiatives uh, you know, up before voters in, across the country. Uh, we're, we're sort of sitting here like in some amazement, I guess, about this new development. There are two ballot initiatives up where people are going to weigh in directly, okay? But as Anna said, even in Washington and Colorado, only 50% of people polled, around 50%, only half of the voters polled, uh, appear to be favoring these proposals. You work on this every day as an advocate. Your organization has been doing this for years. We're not even talking about you know, that in Illinois. We're not at that level. Why? What's going on? If this makes all sorts of sense, we're talking about what's, what's going on. What kind of resistance, what kind of pushback do you encounter? Uh, well, I think there's a lot of resistance uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, Illinois Normal, as you said, has been around for, for a while now, over 10 years, almost 12 years now. Uh, and it's been an organization that's, that's dedicated to reforming cannabis laws, particularly throughout Illinois. Uh, we know that there's a lot, you know, the National Normal Organization has been around for more than 40 years. It has chapters throughout the country at different state and local and, and university levels as well, um, all working towards this common goal. 
so, uh, you know, it's been a fight that's been going on for a long time. A lot of people say, you know, we've been fighting this for 40 years. What's taking so long? Uh, I think some, a lot of it has to do with that the failure of the drug war is really only truly becoming apparent now. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, you had the intellectual and moral arguments in favor of cannabis uh, regulation, decriminalization, and, and, and similar measures for other drugs. But you didn't have the, the pressing moral weight of 800,000 arrests of all of these millions and millions of people that are being uh, processed, that are being disenfranchised, that, are, that, that there are so many victims of the drug war now, and that the racial disparity has gotten so, so great. Um, uh, one of the arguments of, of the new Jim Crow uh, is that up until now, up until, uh, you know, up until the, the drug war was really escalated, states and local authorities that wanted to try to use uh, criminal sanctions to conduct social policy from a racial perspective had other means at their disposal. And as the, you know, the Civil Rights Act and, and other laws and federal intervention came into place, uh, things like the drug laws became the way that they were able to try to exercise control over what they perceive to be problem communities. You know, if we think there's gang activity going on but we can't prove it, we can bust them for drugs because we know they're using drugs. Now, they know that everybody's using drugs, at least to the degree that, uh, like you said, among different groups, uh, the, the usage rates are the same. But that was one way that they were able to, uh, in, in order to push forward that. And, and now, just as we're seeing as time goes on, it just becomes less and less tenable as the number, you know, the, the body count in the drug war, so to speak, rises, both in terms of people who've gone to prison and as well as the, the violence that you see from the black market from, from, uh, from, the, from the drug war and from all the cartels that are involved in that. Uh, you know, I think alcohol prohibition, as we said, had a similar track where at first it seemed like a great idea. It was 20 or 30 years of, of, of dedicated uh, uh, organizing in communities to say we have this huge problem with alcohol. How are we going to address it? They said, Federal prohibition is the way to address it. And even then, federal prohibition for a while, they were celebrating and said, look, it's working great. And it wasn't until years and years and, and the violence escalated and the problems escalated that it, that it really became an issue. Um, and then there's the education aspect. Uh, up until recently, it was relatively easier for government authorities, for other uh, you know, authority figures to disseminate uh, false information about drugs, about you know the reefer madness, about all the dangers of cannabis that we know now simply aren't there. Not to say that there are no dangers, not to say that there aren't risks or negative consequences associated with cannabis or other drugs, but that the vast majority of them have been overblown or are just flat out not true. Um, and that's to say nothing of the health benefits, of the medical benefits uh, uh, that we're seeing states uh, look at. So I think that's why you, you saw the, the issue begin with the medical front because you had people that were very sick and were very sympathetic uh, and, and people with cancer and, and HIV and MS that were using cannabis to alleviate their symptoms uh, and they became very sympathetic and, and people wanted to support and help them. Uh, but as time's, time has gone on, we, we've seen that, that a more comprehensive change to our drug policy needs to happen. Uh, as far as Illinois in particular, uh, you know, people think of Illinois as a liberal state, but in a lot of ways our political structures are very, um, you know, they're, 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 they're sticky. They're, they're slow in a lot of ways. You know, we don't have ballot initiatives. You're, you're no being way. polite. I'm a political That's right. Reporter. Sure. Of course. Of course. But, <laughs> but, you know, all of these other, most of these other ballot initiatives are voter initiatives, which is why you see, uh, like you said, varying degrees of, of, of seriousness, varying degrees of, of detail, orientation, and focus. Um, in Illinois, we pretty much have to go through the legislature. So we've worked as Illinois Normal to draft a tax and regulate bill. Uh, we've submitted it through the Legislative Reference Bureau in Springfield to, to mark it up and make it look like a good, clean, legitimate law. Uh, and I mean, it's out there, so to speak, uh, in the sense that uh, the, the legislators in Springfield are aware in it, but they've been still fighting over medical cannabis. You know, the medical cannabis bill has been stalled for the last 18 months or so. It's gotten pretty close to passing, but, but not quite over the line. And, and uh, uh, some, some, some various legislators have wa worked strongly to try and continue that. Lou Lang, in particular, in the House representative, has, has pushed that. Um, so, uh, you know, again, there's a number of issues. P the, the movement has focused, I believe, on, to some degree, rightfully so, on the medical issue, seeing it as the more viable path that more people supported medical. And most of the polling has shown that, that even now that we're seeing 50% polling, 50% support for, for legalization or regulation and taxation, we're seeing 60, 70, in some places, 80% support for medical cannabis. You know, well, well, much bigger numbers, much stronger numbers. And so the efforts have gone in those to, to make those arguments to persuade 
voters and legislators in those areas. Um, and so we sort of followed that track in Illinois to the same degree. Um, but those, those conversations about decriminalization, about taxation and regulation, they are going on. Um, but as we know in Illinois, uh, sometimes things move more slowly than they do in other places. Do, uh, do you I'll be real brief, but I think my comments are helpful here because we have been pushing, uh, with, especially with patients, and we got to get veterans involved uh, on the medical marijuana bill in Illinois. We've come within three votes, uh, give or take, uh, three different times now. And it's going to happen, I hope, in the veto session this fall. But what I think I can relate to you that answers your question is where the resistance has come from. In broader strokes, it's legislators that are afraid of being, appearing to be soft on crime. Uh, that's really where it is. I've talked to countless, you can count them so it's not countless, but I've talked to an awful lot of legislators <laughs> who you talk to and they, you know in their heart they're with you. But they, what they do is they dodge and they say, well, I gotta talk to my police chief. Well, you know what the police chief is gonna say. I mean, expecting law enforcement uh, to support this change is like expecting doctors who've been trained all their lives to save lives to support euthanasia. They're, they would have to change their entire mindset as, as law enforcement officials to change. And, and so, and then you have legislators that are worried about the, the counter vote because of the fear to be soft on crime. So they hide behind what are basically not supportable issues. They don't listen to the fact that pot's more available than alcohol now. Uh, they don't listen to the fact that uh, well, the, the two issues that are hardest to overcome uh, beyond just the generalized, uh, I don't want to be soft on crime or I'll hide behind my police chief, is the question of uh, impairment when driving and uh, whatever might happen in the workplace. And those are answerable concerns. Uh, they are not in any way comparable to the enormous damage that's being done by our current drug laws. But you can't get over that hump of, gee, I might be soft on crime through the federal level and at every level below that. Um, I would like to first mention that it, it's, I think it's important to distinguish the war on drugs with the war on marijuana or marijuana prohibition with drug prohibition. To conflate the two is not just um, confusing of, it, it's not only seeing the two as, have, as being equals. You know, marijuana and heroin are not the same. Marijuana and cocaine, not the same. Methamphetamine and marijuana, not the same. The, and there are numerous differences that make it that way. So not by conflating those, those drugs, the war on drugs with the war on marijuana, we're, we're missing the uniqueness of marijuana in our society. And it's also um, not advantageous to uh, a movement that seeks reform because Society does not come close to having any positive mindset towards legalizing heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine. Marijuana is different. And so when we think, when, when we say things like the war on drugs has failed or it's time to end the war on drugs, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good strategy for advocates. Um, beyond that, in terms of why Illinois hasn't, you know, had a little bit more progress being uh, known as more of a liberal state. Marijuana isn't even decriminalized here. Like, if you're, if you're arrested for possession of 2.5 grams or less, I think you go, you're incarcerated for 30 days. I mean, convicted, if you're convicted. Um, most states have implemented decriminalization, which is if you're arrested for possession of a small amount, and the small amounts vary by state, then you don't go to jail. It's, it's a civil fine, so it becomes a civil offense. Um, most states have begun with that and then gone toward medical marijuana. And again, well, I'm not even going to say most. That has been uh, the trend of some states. Um, and so for Illinois to still be in a strictly prohibited mindset, where even for, for possession, you go to jail, um, and then to try and go straight to legalization. Again, if we're thinking in terms of strategy, uh, that might be a difficult step to take, just, in, just, out in the, just outrightly going directly to it. Um, I, let me just jump in. I would only, 
I, I would um, dispute one point. There is some de facto decriminalization in Illinois. It depends on who you are. And that, that gets at the heart of one of the issues here is that in, in uh, some communities, uh, you are free to smoke marijuana, to use marijuana, um, certainly behind closed doors. But I can tell you, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this with the camera rolling because I don't want there to be a change in enforcement strategy, but I live near uh, the beach in Chicago, Illinois, and there are certain nights I come home and you can smell uh, people enjoying marijuana out on the beach in a very public place. And there are not sweeps, people are not um, stopped and frisked there, uh, but they are in other parts of town. So uh, not only do we not have a formal decriminalization policy, but we have an informal policy, which um, in some places it is decriminalized and in other places um, it does get you locked up. And worse than that is uh, we found that 90% of the possession cases in the city of Chicago are actually thrown out. So not only giving somebody a record and we spending the money and the police time to lock them up for it, but uh, then we're actually not even following through with the prosecution. And I'm not saying we should follow through with the prosecution, just pointing out how inane it is to uh, think that this is a, an enforcement strategy on one level and then to completely abandon it at another point in the process. Um, but I wanted to, th I wanted to throw out well, there, first, I, yeah, I, please. I did just want to mention that, that that's not a dispute. I'm only referring to what's on the books. Of you course. Know, Illinois, mar marijuana possession in Illinois is not decriminalized. Now, on the state level, but we did a study with Protestants for the Common Good, and it wasn't the kind of study you do at Carnegie Mellon. We just went through some public websites and found that of the 153 home rural municipalities in Illinois, 72 have decriminalization statutes, ordinances. The city councils very quietly have realized uh, that it's not worth the trouble to take kids in, uh, run them through court, and then uh, have the charges dismissed. Even in uh, Springfield. Uh, even in Springfield, even in the state capitol. Uh, so, and, and of course, what's the difference? Uh, that's not true in Chicago. Most of the places we're talking about are pretty much white suburban communities. But de facto, there is a count that says over half of our home rule municipalities are already there. Well, I wanted to follow up and um, something else Michael had said about the strategy of for those who do believe they're going to be... And I'm not be... advocating any strategy. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just... <laughs> Go ahead and advocate, man. That's no, all right. I, I am, I am... Step I am, up there. Yeah. You know, I am a... trying to differentiate the war on drugs with the war on marijuana because marijuana is not the same as any other illicit drug. Okay, we're not going to elect you or not elect you, so don't worry about it. But you're about you're it. saying just as a as an academic from an academic point of view, you your analysis is that this this saying that we need to end the war on drugs sort of muddles the chances or, or muddles the argument in some people's minds for um, well, moving forward on marijuana. Prevalence of marijuana is possibly an order of magnitude higher, depends on what survey you look at, than prevalence of other illicit drugs. Um, it's virtually impossible to have a fatal overdose on marijuana. And the only reason I say virtually is because uh, maybe... There, there may be some in the audience who've tried, so... <laughs> ma 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 well, ma mathematically it's possible, but practically it's impossible. Okay. Well, virtually in that it's not the, the psychoactive effect is not going to be what directly does it does it it's going to be its effect on your behavior so in other words you could go and do something that you wouldn't normally do because you were reacting negatively to it but in pharmacological terms it will not kill you um, heroin cocaine will uh, Marijuana is not associated with hepatitis C or HIV transmissions because it's not an intravenously injected drug. Um, heroin, yes. Methamphetamine, yes. Uh, the differences go on and on. And so conflating drugs hard, that include all hard drugs with marijuana um, is not doing justice to the debate. Well, I, 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 I was just going to step in, and I would, I would disagree with you in a, in a couple parts. One, I would agree first that, objectively speaking, there is no doubt that what has happened, that the war on drugs has really been mostly a war on marijuana, and it is definitely true that cannabis is, if not fundamentally different, substantially different from most of the other drugs that receive it's prohibition. Right. However, 
you know, we the people didn't start the war on drugs. It was started by the federal government. We the people didn't come up with the name the war on drugs. The federal government did. So to the degree that we are disagreeing with the policy of the federal government, which does not just include cannabis, but does include other drugs, we're saying we need to, fund, we need to end the entire war on drugs as it's currently structured and, and come up with a new strategy that, that, forward, that moving is, forward. That is entirely admirable. Our paper and our research is on the legalization of marijuana, and so it's difficult to respond to uh, ideas relating to the war on drugs. Yeah, but you're, that, you're a smart guy. I'm going to jump in. You know what? You're a smart guy. What do you think? Anna, let me, let me pick on you instead. Uh, do you agree with your colleague's assessment, uh, or, or what's your take on the matter? Well, I mean, I, th I think what Mike is, is trying to say um, is just essentially that it's not, well, I, I, w I would say that I agree more or less because what I think it, the point that you're making um, is not, ne sorry, I'm, I'm wording this terribly, but I guess I, I don't know that we even necessarily need to respond to discussions of of how, how things are labeled or how things are put into the war on drugs. I think what Mike just wants to point out is that um, in talking about marijuana, I mean, there are some, I think what he's trying to say, some aspects of the war on drugs that aren't necessarily terrible and that like we don't want to, we certainly wouldn't want to like legalize heroin or, uh, you know, still would probably want to have a big crackdown on heroin. And, and that's, clear. and. and the, the problem is the people that are fighting the war on drugs don't themselves differentiate. Therefore, we are not wrong in using the, their arguments, okay. uh, rebutting their arguments. We, we know the difference between marijuana yeah. and heroin. I'm and not crack. saying that we don't. I'm saying that. But, but the people that are opposing the war don't acknowledge the difference. You write this like seven for one second. You, you run this thing. Um, and, 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 and no, 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 I think this is all very important, but what I hear Michael saying is something like, when we talk about a drug that's very different from, let's just say hard drugs, cannabis, and we add them together, you're not going to get the same kind of support that you would for legalization of cannabis. So if legalization of cannabis is your goal, or if you're trying to you know, move cannabis policy, adding the hard drugs to that debate might not be the most strategic way of doing that. I is that what you're saying? Uh, I regret <laughs> using the word strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, what I'm saying is our analysis is on marijuana legalization. Sure. And so when we lump that into ending the war on drugs, while marijuana prohibition accounts for the majority of the war on drugs, uh, it's not the same. And we, only, we want to focus on marijuana legalization by itself. And th that's what our paper is on. That's what we came here to talk about. That's sure. the only thing that we did an analysis of. And so I just wanted to caution us from, from interpreting what we're saying about marijuana legalization to a general war on drugs. And just, and just to sort of close that point, I would say I would definitely agree with you that as an organization like Normal that is focused on cannabis, we don't focus specifically or in any particular detail on how, what policy should be had for heroin or cocaine or for other drugs. However, you know, as an organization that thinks that our drug policy has failed, we're saying that in general we need to re revisit our policy and so that's going to involve... Absolutely. Look, but, but a policy... Again, we're, 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 an, right, right. we're a cannabis a organization where we, as well. If the so policy is and war on drugs, that is a very, very different policy than legalized marijuana. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my point. That's, I, mean, I, I think that's an important point for people to hear. And I think it's, it's important. I, I mean, I was struck by the fact, it, maybe you didn't like the word strategy, but, and you want to take it back. But I, I personally well, I mean, was struck by the fact, uh, no, 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 <laughs> of, of, you know, if marijuana legalization is pulling at 50%, but let's say cocaine legalization is pulling it, I'm guessing, you know, below probably 10%, that you might not want to include the other drugs if your goal is to change the policies around marijuana. That's, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think anyone, uh, you know, most people who are interested in um, uh, 
changing the drug laws are focused on marijuana and, and even more specifically focused on the possession of marijuana. The very, it's, it's incredibly difficult to even get a uh, well-reasoned conversation as um, we've all been talking about up here about marijuana possession, the very lowest level of, um, you know, of a drug violation, of a drug law violation. And so uh, as a matter of strategy, um, wasn't trying to pick on you, Michael, uh, just keep the discussion going because I think it's an important point. A lot of people, I think, would say that, yeah, it, it's most fruitful to focus on, on that because, uh, first of all, for the practical reason, there is not a mass movement to put a ballot initiative out there to legalize heroin. Um, and uh, second of all, that, you know, a lot of, there, there's the thinking that goes that a lot of people um, need to know that the world will not collapse if um, marijuana possession is legalized or even decriminalized before you start talking about um, drugs that are a lot more difficult for people to get their brains around. That's a very important point. And to just summarize the whole discussion, uh, you cannot take findings about the legalization of marijuana and generalize those findings onto the legalization of other drugs. That, that right there is the whole reason why I want us to, to remember we're talking about legalization of marijuana and not ending the war on drugs. I will accept that. That's all correct. But you cannot, uh, you cannot talk about the legalization of marijuana and advocate for it without being aware, or you are very innocent, naive if you do, that you are up against a monolithic structure at the federal and I would say state and even local level that has a war on drugs mindset. You cannot focus your argument on one drug without running into opposition from a much broader set of arguments. As an advocate, I can, I can see that being a concern, but in considering legalization of marijuana uh, in terms of what, what will happen if a legalization proposal passes, uh, that, that is an, an analysis in and of itself that doesn't... Uh, absolutely. Fair, fair enough. And I would actually throw out there the possibility that um, as more and more of these conversations go on, as more and more of these political movements go on, ballot initiatives are put forward about marijuana, that it will be increasingly difficult for people not to talk about um, other drugs as well, because I think uh, of, of what Al just pointed out, that um, one of the, the, the folks on the other side sort of this, of this debate or this argument um, do lump them all together and moreover see marijuana as a gateway drug not just in terms of use but in terms of politics and um, and so I think it's going to be difficult going forward to completely uh, separate all of them but let's get back to one of the things th there are many other things in your paper you noted um, this, this is one of the potential unintended consequences of marijuana reform movement is that we can get drawn into discussions about powder cocaine and crack cocaine and heroin and different types of heroin and, and all sorts of other uh, it, related issues. It but also makes the point that um, we, we, we talked to the DEA, we talked to the director of the White House Office of Drug Policy, and uh, we had a sit down with a by invitation only meeting of renowned drug policy scholars, and uh, the the understanding of the issue gets incredibly complex. And even people who are very involved in the issue um, have a hard time seeing things that could happen because legalizations never happen. And so we're up here talking about uh, all of these different issues. And it, it just highlights the fact that people heavily involved have different understandings of the same thing. You had an extraordinary opportunity. Did you ask why marijuana is a Schedule One drug, the most in the category of most dangerous drugs with no medicinal value? Did you ask to, to whom? To to the head of the White House, the drug policy. I mean, that would have been a reasonable question. Why is marijuana a Schedule we were, we One? We were drug? there to brief him about these findings, not to, not to, not to elicit information from him. Oh. Well, let me ask you this. There, you outline in your paper all sorts of other potential consequences that um, are not addressed in the proposed legislation. Um, one of them is, uh, let, let, me, let me get to one of them um, in particular, because one of the things I, I think has helped uh, 
sort of pick up steam with this argument or this discussion about whether or not to legalize marijuana is the economics or is the money, um, what we're spending on it. Uh, people who have not been, who, who may have been aware for years that there is a racial gap and how this is enforced, that may not move them deeply, but when they hear about the millions, the billions of dollars that are being spent on this, um, that is something that is more persuasive. When they think about the arguments about what revenues could come in to cash-strapped governments um, in the form of taxation, if, if marijuana were legalized in tax, um, that's certainly an argument that, is, that appears to be gaining some momentum as well. But you guys write in your paper that um, that's not necessarily a slam dunk either. It, it all depends on sort of how that would be set up, who else would legalize, and that sort of thing. Michael, can you briefly, um, just we're also short of time, briefly, uh, you know, yes. talk a little bit about that. Um, well, again, we, we, we began our analysis today talking about how there are these variables that all amount to a high degree of uncertainty in terms of what's legalization going to look like. And it, it really depends on what's in the proposal. What are its, what are, what are its specific provisions? Um, and then the federal response is another beast in and of itself. Uh, we looked at the federal response because it, different federal responses will lead to different market structures. Um, and to get an idea of uh, what the federal response might be, we looked at how they currently enforce federal prohibition in states that have medical marijuana laws. Um, because that does violate the Controlled Substances Act, but it's also a state law that permits, you know, cultivation and production and, and processing and all of that. Um, so if our analysis was that if federal enforcement intensity is lighter than current than its current intensity against mar uh, medical marijuana, which is we're going to target cultivators that have hundreds of plants that yield, you know, thousands of plant uh, or hundreds to thousands of pounds a year. Uh, those are those are the high volume producers. Government gets the most bang for their buck when they uh, interdict there. Um, they also, like I said, send out the letters and make arrests. So if they, if they take a, an approach where they kind of step back a little bit from uh, their current intensity and say, you know what, voters of that state have spoken, we're going to recognize that state's autonomy and let it be. Uh, in that kind of a scenario, um, a typical supply chain for marijuana would be just open market businesses. Uh, walk down to the liquor store and buy a gram or uh, you would have corporations eventually producing and retailing. Um, if federal enforcement is as stringent as it is currently, uh, you would probably have businesses that are a little bit more local, uh, a little bit more hesitant to get big, um, like the dispensaries in states with medical marijuana. Uh, if enforcement gets a little bit more intense, um, the production and distribution and retail would be a little bit more freelance. You know, you might be more averse to renting a location that could possibly be taken from you, uh, where you would attract attention, be arrested. Um, and then federal enforcement could just go, you know, all out, crack down, we're going to try to stomp out the legal market. Uh, they would, in some sense, succeed, and they would push the market back underground. Um, now, why would they do this? Uh, well, because a marijuana market that is fully open and legal is a market where prices will collapse. And the reason why they will collapse is because um, when marijuana is illegal, as it currently is, uh, in order to produce it and pr uh, distribute it, retail or deal or whatever term you want to use, those are all illicit activities. And participating in those activities carries a risk. And you're not going to participate in the activity unless you're compensated for taking that risk upon yourself. And so that inflates the price substantially. Um, so as enforcement intensity for the federal government gets harder and harder, the price falls the least amount. And because when 
uh, prices for marijuana fall, use increases somewhat. Uh, the increase in use following legalization would be the smallest if prices decreased the smallest if the federal government tried its hardest to stamp out the market. Yeah. And, and let me just, just because I, I, you know, I have an economics background, so putting my economist hat on for a minute, I thought that that section of, of the paper was the most interesting. Um, and I think it speaks to, like you said, the uncertainty, not just in terms of degree, but in terms of the number of dimensions and the details. Um, I think a, a good example comparing with alcohol prohibition was, you know, prior to alcohol prohibition, you had saloons that were tied houses and there were, I mean, literally hundreds and thousands. I mean, you think there's a lot of bars around here now. If you were here 120 years ago, it was just, there would have probably been 10 times as many bars in this neighborhood. Uh, saloons, they were all tied to the breweries. There was all sorts of corruption. Um, and then after prohibition, even after prohibition ended, you still had uh, restrictions on home brewing, for example, and small craft brewing. So for up until, and, and age limits as well, but, but you had all these other restrictions which affected the characteristics of the market. It affected what types of firms got involved, whether you have big corporations, whether you have small mom and pop stuff. Uh, even though, you know, alcohol was legal, you, you, those, some of those details uh, really matter. I also thought the price, the price was very interesting because I think um, if you treat cannabis as a uniform, undifferentiated commodity like oil or, or corn, uh, that price model follows exactly right. But if we look again to alcohol, uh, we see also a, enormous price differentiated di differentiation even within similar markets. You have bottles of wine that are $2 and you have bottles of wine that are $200. And sometimes that reflects production costs, but other times it reflects other, other factors. It, 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 you know, higher, you know, increased production costs deliberately by manufacturers to create higher quality products, which affects uh, the nature of the market. So conceivably, even if the feds just gave up and said, you know, Colorado and Washington have, have legalized, we're just going to let them open stores and sell it, you might have entrepreneurs saying, well, you know, people have been used to paying whatever, you know, $300 an ounce for a while now. If I sell it to them for $150, I can convince them it's a good quality because I put all this time and effort. There might still be substantial profit margin in there. You might see different market characteristics depending on any, num any number of factors, not the least of which would be the federal response. So I think, I think it was very interesting to look at those few dimensions, but there are so many dimensions to this issue that, that there, there really is an, a, a very high degree of uncertainty uh, what, what it would look like. Al, Al Anna, what would um, marijuana legalization look like to you guys, ideally, or what, would, what should uh, be avoided going forward? You know, I keep getting forward. involved in advocacy here, but what would it mean to me is that you'd have uh, an extraordinarily important number of African Americans, especially, but uh, uh, whites as well, who wouldn't be carrying an arrest record around. Uh, not too many of them go to prison, but an arrest record around for the rest of their lives and find themselves unemployable. That's what it would look like to me. Uh, another thing it would mean, and we found uh, in uh, looking at the, the process of, of arrests, that 60 percent of low-level drug users that the police bring in the city of Chicago are never charged. They can go to Cook County Jail for a few days, uh, uh, or they can have an arrest on their record that's never expunged, but they're never, uh, they're never charged and certainly not convicted. So it would simply mean an element of fairness in our society that doesn't exist right now. Anna, we haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, so in that research, and actually going back to some of the topics that we were discussing previously, so part of the reason why I was silent um, in talking about the war on drugs is because I don't really think um, those those kind of um, statements <laughs> necessarily are within the scope of um, the work that we did because we are trying to be objective here. So in terms of how advocates are going to frame their the larger picture of where they're fitting in specific goals for um, marijuana legalization is not is not really what we focus on in our analysis. I mean, our goal, and also yeah. in response to your question um, about why we didn't push the DEA about that, our goal really has been to just look at okay, what would the different scenarios be, and um, the the idea is just to inform. So both to inform. And I, I apologize. To inform I, it was more accusatory than I meant to sound. No, I, no, I would love yeah. to be able to ask him that question. <laughs> That's why I, yeah, no, I, no, no, I understand, but so um, so in terms of you know my ideal legalization, I mean you know maybe from a personal standpoint I might have some ideas, but in terms of our our paper here and an analysis that we did, we're not we're not really trying to go there at all. 
Yeah, but you guys did some, all right, fair enough. But I, I would just throw out there, you guys did a lot of work on this, did a lot of research, you're well informed on it. I'm not saying uh, what's the world you live in where you could get the best bud you could possibly get. I'm saying uh, what sort of legal issues, political issues, um, did you encounter in researching this that you think if, if someone is, is pushing, folks out here, let's say they're advocates, um, wanted to change the law in Illinois, what kinds of things should they be considering? What would the process uh, look like to so you? Because yeah, Mike and I were talking about this one, so we could answer this like from perspectives of different people. So we were talking about like if, if someone did want to pass um, an initiative, then should we, can we talk about that? Or is that Oh. <laughs> you are on the record. We don't just we don't want you to just read off the paper. We can read the paper. Your brains are up here. Let's, no, I, uh, I mean in the sense of I don't want to go. Um, so this is not like this is not my personal opinion or what would be my ideal statement. But like if if someone were trying to pass an initiative, then you know you would want to have a, a tax structure that wasn't too high, such that they'd be tax evasion. Um, so this is this is from. I mean, but I, we can do the same analysis from for like what the DA would want to do. So I'm not I'm not advocating this, but. Um, I mean, one thing, you might be valuable. I mean, you've done valuable work, and, and we, uh, you might want to look at the implications of the alternative. What you've done is isolate alternatives. It could it could fall out this way. It could fall out that way. You might want to, to the extent that there are models where it has fallen out that way in other environments, if there are any, what, what have been the particular yeah. effects. So you could look at the effects of the models as opposed to the groundwork you've done in identifying the models. Yeah, well, I mean, part of it, part of the problem in doing that is everything is so uncertain because this is so un unprecedented. Yeah, so there exactly. has been no situation. I mean, some people will point to the Netherlands, but really the Netherlands, it's not legalized there either. So there, there really is no precedent where, where retail sale commercial, yep. where, at, where all of that has been legalized. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I definitely feel, you know, sometimes it comes up uh, in, in my discussions, you know, if, if for example, tomorrow uh, the federal government just said, okay, we're, we're descheduling uh, cannabis, now it's, it, it's fair game for, for sales and states can do what they want. Uh, you know, first of all, I think an organization like Normal would still exist because these questions that we're asking here aren't going away and we don't know the answers to them and we are going to have to try things out, see what, see what models work, see what happens if you have a tax level at a certain point, see what happens to the market given certain characteristics of, of restrictions on what types of entities can be distributors, what types of entities can be retailers, how that's handled, uh, as we discussed, like with alcohol, is there, is there growing, home growing or not? It may be, in, you know, we could conceivably have a tax and regulate model where home production is, is illegal, just like it was for alcohol technically for, for 40 years after the end of, end of prohibition. That's right, and 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 well, and it's a lot easier to cultivate a marijuana plant than yeah. to. Uh, I was. I think we're about to get a question. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I was asking Kathy well, how much time we had, but I see a few hands up, so maybe it's time. Can I have two minutes, and I'll I'll just say our pricing. I'm gonna I'm just gonna run over what the prices are gonna be, and that'll be it. Um, because this is actually an important piece. Uh, we, we did an analysis of how much it would cost to produce marijuana if it were legal um, in a conceivably efficient manner. And we based this analysis off of uh, scientific literature that's been conducted in the Netherlands by agronomists, um, actually by reading actual marijuana grow books. Um, and our finding was that you could actually produce a pound of marijuana um, under these laws uh, for $30 per pound in a farm um, for between $70 to $215 uh, in a greenhouse. And these numbers actually come from a previous analysis that uh, we, we used to model our analysis. Um, but then in another analysis, we also found that the, the authors, believing that the federal government wouldn't just lay down and let legalization happen, uh, if you were a state that legalized and then a bunch of people started to rent a bunch of farmland and grow marijuana, that's pretty brazen. And it would be easy for federal agents to see what you're doing and to seize your product. So the analysis was grow houses will probably be a more 
typical scenario. Um, and so we looked at a way to analyze the oh, production price. So by, by grow houses, you mean houses where there's just a way to resell what's marijuana plant? In, indoor production. So like they would look like <laughs> regular houses on the outside. No. Yeah. And uh, so the finding was that you could have wholesale, legal wholesale marijuana prices would be about um, $400 in California and Washington and uh, a little bit more than $300 per pound in Colorado. And that is uh, compared to illegal wholesale prices ranging from uh, two to three to up to $5,000. So we're talking about a huge drop in price. Um, and again, this is a scenario where grow houses um, and given these production cost estimates. Uh, retail price, $35 an ounce in California, 33 in Colorado, $60 in Washington because of their um, unique tax structure, uh, compared to between $250 to $350 per ounce illegal. So we're, we're, we're talking about a very real large price decline that will have an impact on consumption. Um, and that, that's an important piece to consider when thinking about marijuana legalization in the abstract. And as well as what effects these prices have Take it away. <laughs> the Reverend. I have the Honorable. I have the Honorable uh, Connie Howard here who has a question. She would like to, she's a state representative and she's got a question. So here you go. Thank you very much, and let me first say that I really appreciate the fact that I was invited, and I have enjoyed the entire conference, uh, especially this, um, this panel that we have in front of us, because it's interesting to hear uh, one being talked about when people don't know that I am a part of the legislature. <laughs> uh, uh, Reverend Sharp, um, if you say we're three votes close to the medical marijuana, I thought it was five. But each time I think about that and think about what we're trying to do and talk about in terms of just non-medical marijuana, it's, it's just mind-boggling because my colleagues are so insensitive that they could care less about pain that people are having. I also wanted to ask my question, and that is, how does any of you believe that the, um, the, the discussion we're having would impact the prison industrial complex here in the state of Illinois? Uh, as, as we've seen the numbers in terms of uh, arrests in particular, but also in terms of, of uh, incarcerations, the vast majority of the growth, not all, but the vast majority of the growth in prison populations, both in Illinois and in general, has been from drug crimes, and, and particularly nonviolent drug crimes, but also the violent crimes related to the black market surrounding illegal drugs. Um, so the hope is that by taking, first of all, by, as we said, you know, that users, people that are only possessing drugs would be definitely staying away from the system uh, and by taking away from the black market a substantial source of their revenue that uh, there would be a significant decrease in violent and other crimes related to the black market trade that we would see a substantial decrease uh, in the prison population. Um, which, you know, as, as we've seen in other states, you know, in Illinois we have public prisons. California, they have a huge private prison lobby. But just driving when I was down in Springfield for a lobby day a couple of weeks ago, I still see signs saying save, uh, uh, right, save right prison, save Dixon prison, whatever the other one was called. Um, so even in, even, you know, you have, we have to remember that when we talk about the prison industrial complex, it's a real constituency of people, of jobs, particularly in communities that, that have been hard hit by other economic factors. Absolutely. And what are those people going to do? Where will they work if we make a decision to do some things that will eliminate a prison? Those are their economic engines in those towns. So that is another thing that we have to be concerned about. How do we replace the jobs that they have? And not that I'm saying that I want anybody to be a prison guard. That's right. But I'm saying I know that we will always have the lobbyists against uh, anything that we're talking about here, if people believe that that is going to ultimately eliminate their jobs. That's right, and, and that's where I think you need to emphasize not only you know, tax revenue, but particularly the cost savings from the enforcement. Instead of, hiring instead of hiring prison guards, instead of building prisons, we can hire teachers and build schools. We can hire doctors and nurses and build hospitals. We can hire 
treatment, you know, people to serve in treatment centers to deal with addiction and other issues related to drug use. Um, there are other ways we can spend our money. You know how tight the budget crunch is down there. There are plenty of places that we're cutting that we shouldn't be cutting, but we're doing it because we've decided that incarcerating people is more valuable. And as we see, you know, Governor Quinn has come out and taken a stand and said, we're going to at least take the first step. We're going to close a couple prisons. We're going to start to to wind it down. But you're right, it, it's going to be a slow process. That You can't just you know, shut down half the prisons uh, in Illinois overnight and, and get rid of half of those jobs without any pushback. We, we do need a plan, but, but it needs to be part of a concerted effort to work to make Illinois a better place uh, for everybody. A conference here at Roosevelt, um, someone asked a similar question, what about the jobs, you know, in the prison system and, and whatnot, which is obviously something people think about. And, you know, my response, and this is not a, unique to me, this is something I crib from somebody else, but man, what an efficient, inefficient way to put people to work, uh, to, to build prisons and to jail them. I mean, let's save the money, get people out of prison, and, and find other ways to generate jobs. And just a, a question, and maybe I'm cranky and it's a Friday afternoon, but <laughs> I, human services in the state, against your votes, I mean, I know where you are on this, uh, have been cut, you know, I'll, I'll make up the figures, but 10% a year for a number of years now. Why don't people say, what's going to happen to all those workers who provide services to the disabled? What's going to happen to all those workers who provide to keep long elderly people out of uh, uh, out of nursing home? What's going to happen to, and you can list the services. It's interesting that it does happen only much more vividly. Teachers. when it, Yeah, teachers, sure, when it comes to uh, what's going to happen if we close some prisons. Just a point to think about. Can I also add, add something to that, though? Um, so we should also be aware that though some of the estimates for um, like the number of people in prison for marijuana are, are usually o or tend to be over estimate because it's like based on marijuana as a, marijuana arrests as a portion of all drug incarcerations, whereas a lot of marijuana mon marijuana arrests don't actually end up in long-term incarceration. So. In that sense, um, it might not make, I, I mean, on the one hand, it might not, the cost savings might not be as big as some of the estimates, but it also might not have as big an impact on, like, jobs in prisons, for example. And then um, also um, in terms of violence, because you're talking about violence, so, but, but marijuana isn't really associated in the U.S. with um, much violence, as, certainly as compared to, like, other other drugs, so. Someone else wants to ask a question, but I, I saw that in your paper and I would contest that point. Um, that's actually one of the key arguments that uh, the DEA in Chicago and the Chicago Police Department, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere, make in favor of uh, continuing a prohibition on marijuana is because they say this is really just money for the gangs. And I can tell you, um, doing reporting out in neighborhoods that are struggling with gangs and gang violence, that is true. I mean, marijuana is still uh, is still a cash, is, is still a form of cash for um, illegal drug markets. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if that's, you know, that's a whole other thing. We have another question, but I, I would challenge that uh, notion that marijuana isn't, um, people are not committing violence over marijuana, perhaps not directly in the way that you see in Mexico right now, but I think that indirectly that is a, that definitely is a factor in some of the the gang violence and street violence we see in cities like Chicago. And, and, and getting back to the cycle, you know, when we disenfranchise people, when we make it harder for them to get jobs because they have a drug conviction, that provides further incentive for them to continue to commit illegal acts, to be, continue to be involved in the drug trade and other illegal gang activity because they've, they've been disenfranchised to the point where they have not very much to lose. So it's, it's not, you know, no, nobody's suggesting that legalizing cannabis is going to put gangs or even cartels out of business, but it's about making as much of an impact, a positive well, impact, as we can. Which even in yes. your paper is 20% of their revenue. Yeah, I don't, in Mexico, not in Mexico. I don't, this is a question, it's, it's more of a comment, but I, I really get angered when people say that the police officers are against legalization, because if there wasn't a drug war, our police officers, peace officers, they would lose jobs. So it's, they have a vested interest in keeping the drug war. Without the drug war, I live in a nice little theoretically calm community of Northbrook, and if it wasn't for the Northbrook police busting kids for pipes and papers, they wouldn't have anything to do. So I, don't, I think it's a really 
weak argument to say that law enforcement officers, I don't know how you put this into policy, don't want legalization. Of course they don't want legalization. If it's legalized, there are going to be a lot less law enforcement officers. They're going to lose power, they're going to lose jobs, they're going to lose representation at the legislature, they're going to lose all kinds of things. So they're not the best people to ask, that's all. It's like asking restauranteurs if everybody should go on a, on a liquid diet. I mean, it, it just makes no sense to ask the officers where they stand on this. And when mayors do that, when governors do that, it infuriates me, that's all I want to say. I, and, and to the other point, just the whole moral thing of the war on drugs, I personally would like to end, and I'm someone who has no um, skin in this game, the whole war on drugs, why we criminalize people for doing something to their own body is, I think, basically immoral. And, and talking about law, law enforcement in particular, there's a great organization, uh, LEAP, which is Law Enforcement Against right. Prohibition. Uh, we had their executive director come and speak to us uh, back last fall, uh, Neil Franklin. He's an ex-drug warrior for 20 years. He was in the Maryland State Police, fought the drug war, believed in the drug war, finally came to see why it was failing and now speaks out against it. But one of the statistics he had, and I'm just going to throw this out there because I thought it was really interesting, was that in the 1960s, 90% of homicides resulted in a conviction. 90% uh, of, of other serious violent crimes resulted in arrest and conviction. Today, or 10 years ago, I think was the stat, the number's down in the 60%. Well, why is that? I mean, there, there's any number of causes, uh, but you know, we watch CSI and, and, and NCIS and all these shows where we think we have DNA and all this technology. Shouldn't it be easier to get murder convictions? And I would argue, again, this is my argument, that at least some of that, if not a substantial portion, is our, not just the police, but our public policy officials, our elected officials, saying, the drug war is the war to fight. The resources are being devoted to the drug war. And it's frankly easier to bust somebody for possession than it is to solve a murder. I mean, that, and so. They also have here in Cook County, uh, the national government has a policy known as high intensity drug trafficking areas, HIDTA, I think that's what it stands for. Anyway, um, they identify counties where there is what they consider to be a high volume of drug trafficking and counties designated as such receive lots of federal money. Um, not making any connections in terms of what that money is causing. Well, in the end, um, to, I don't know if it's something that legalizing marijuana will reduce the number of law enforcement officials. Uh, it, it's actually, if we think about the broken windows theory of policing where, you know, instead of reacting to 911 calls or patrolling a neighborhood and looking for something happening, you are being proactive and arresting people for whatever offense you deem to be an, an appropriate intervention. Um, if marijuana becomes legal, it's possible that you could see an increase in arrests for loitering or panhandling or just any other simple misdemeanor that would allow law enforcement officials to demonstrate we are involved heavily in this community. Um, and you can say that they are targeting the wrong communities or whatever, but the, the, the simple point is they are making these arrests and ha having this action so that yeah, we we need we yeah. Let's get one other one last question, and then um, sorry, other folks. Uh, we can those of us who are able to we'll stay, we'll keep going. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, I guess I, I reacted negatively. To Mr. Lee's comment of distinguishing between marijuana and other drugs, mainly by giving me a list of things like the use of needles and I think the harmful effects of these other drugs. And I think, you know, one of the problems you have to think about is whether these harmful effects are caused by the drugs or by some other things. For instance, the use of needles, whether or not it's the fact that, that uh, we don't have these needles, we, the needles became uh, uh, the use of those needles became a, uh, a need in terms of how we are making these needles available to people or, or the fact that 
uh, the, uh, the, the problems that, uh, in terms of some of the health issues that are associated with some of these other drugs, are due to other policies that we have that have nothing to do with the innate ner nature of the drug itself. I think that the, the, instead of focusing on that, which really uh, destroys the, the cohesion between other people that have problems with the drug policies in general, that perhaps you ought to be focusing on the, the real differences between, I think, the drugs, which I think uh, is the addiction, the, the addiction between maybe marijuana as opposed to some of the other drugs. So I'm wondering if you ever looked at the relative addiction rates in terms of marijuana versus cocaine or, or heroin and using that as a basis and a justification for making uh, a distinguishing feature between the two. We definitely have, and that should have been something that I mentioned because it is yet another distinction between those, the hard drugs and marijuana. Um, and I can understand the spirit of your disagreeing with that aspect of it where, yes, it probably is the war on drugs that leads to a uh, higher uh, likelihood of dirty needles or even just the use of needles in general because it provides a more intense high than you would need to get if it were legal because you would go and get an appropriate dosage. Um, but the, the, the essence of my point was when prohibited, uh, there are these effects for these drugs, and when prohibited, there are these effects on marijuana use and how it's used and so on and so forth, and that they are different. So, um, yes, I agree that it is the policy that leads to those things being more common, but I think that that is yet another, dis another reason for the distinction. Okay, that's a debatable point, but the debate must rest for now. Um, so I want to thank, every, thank all of you guys. Great questions. Sorry for those who didn't get to present them at the mic. And, this, and thank the, all the panelists here. Thanks um, to Anna and Michael for presenting a great paper and for letting us pick it apart. The discussion and debate is part of what this is all about. So thank you all very much. But I just want to say thank you so much to Roosevelt University for their gracious hosting of this event and to Kathy for all the work she did in coordinating it. Um, the motivation of having this type of event is to promote dialogue among policy researchers, policy analysts, policy advocates. Um, and I think our panels succeeded in highlighting some very interesting points. The first panel, the insight that I gained was I was thinking of policy researchers um, and policy actors, but I was sort of forgetting the people on the receiving end of the policy. And Stephanie and Ed brought up that really important point on our first panel. And our second panel really highlights the importance of the distinction between an analyst and an advocate. And I think that analysts would see it as a violation of their pro professional code to become advocates because they need to be cleanly analytical. But, but those of you who are advocates, feel free to be informed by their research. Take it and run run with it and do what they can't do because we couldn't put credibility in their research if they went off and advocated as well. They must maintain their analytical credibility. But that provides a great platform for advocates to take what we can learn from them and, um, you know, and to go forward. So I think we've accomplished the goal of bringing together all of these groups um, and to move forward is exciting and I hope we continue our dialogue and collaboration. Thank you.